Hello, Booktube, and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. This week, I'm working on the grammar book, an ESL EFL teacher's course by Marianne Celsi Mercia and Diane Larson Freeman. Uh, by the way, I, I'm going to apologize at the beginning of this video for the fact that everything shows up in mirror image on this camera. Uh, so that, that apology is going to hold through for everything else. And uh, also the complete illustrated fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm by the Brothers Grimm. So uh, the grammar book, actually, I did not make a lot of progress on this week. Uh, the bulk of my reading went to the Brothers Grimm. Uh, the grammar book, I only read 16 pages, uh, finished up chapter 7, Tints in Aspect System. So the way the authors of this book are dealing with tense and aspect is uh, they're not talking about the individual uses of each tense. Uh, for example, they're not saying the present perfect can be used for this and this and this and this and this. Well, actually they are, they are, but, but th that's not their main point. The, the main point is that the unifying meaning of the perfect aspect is looking back at something, either from the perspective of the past, the past perfect, from the perspective of the present, the pres present perfect, or the perspective of the future, the future perfect. Uh, they, t they treat the uh, will future as a tense in here, even though that's controversial, um, because linguists like to say that there's only two tenses in English, present and past. Um, they, they, they acknowledge that the future, will future isn't really a tense, but then go ahead and treat it as a tense anyways, which I, I think is what most grammar books do. Um, yeah, the, the, the treatment of the unifying meaning of each aspect, uh, or the, the tenses combining with aspects, reminds me of the treatment that Michael Lewis gave it in the English verb. Uh, which is a book I've reviewed on this channel. And then, sure enough, on their bibliography for the end of chapter 7, they list the English verb by Michael Lewis as one of their sources here, which I was mildly surprised by because I got the impression that Michael Lewis was more of a polemicist, maybe, than a serious scholar. He, he seems to be arguing... I mean, in both his books, the, the lexical approach and the English verb, more so in the lexical approach, but, but somewhat in the English verb, he was arguing everybody else is doing it wrong. Uh, the, these, these other grammar books have got it all wrong. He, he seems to be more interested in starting arguments. Uh, also, as far as I could tell, all of his examples came from his intuition rather than than looking at the corpus data um, whereas these authors tend to be much more interested in looking at the corpus before ma making generalizations but michael lewis is only one of the many different uh, authors they have listed here and then i just barely got into chapter eight which is modal auxiliaries and related forms sorry modal auxiliaries and related phrasal forms. Um, and as I've mentioned in past vlogs, this is my second time through this material because I got, I got several chapters in last year before giving up on this book and then coming back to it now. So I, I've often mentioned that I'm somewhat depressed about how little I remember going back to this book a year later. The, the idea that reading for professional development can be a chore, plus you read stuff and then you forget it a year later, so like, ah, oh, what was the point? Um, but this, this is actually an argument that I remember uh, one year later, because this stuck in my, my mind quite well. This is the argument that uh, the modals do not have past tenses. They have historical past tenses, but they're no longer connected to their past tenses in a normal present past relationship. So the, the, the ones here, uh, can, could, will, would, 
may, might, shall, should, uh, which in most grammar ten books is treated as a present and past tense. Can is a present tense, could is a past tense. Uh, may is present, might, past, shall, present, should, past. Um, but, but they're saying essentially, uh, well, not essentially, they're, they're, they're saying that they have, they're, they're all to be treated as tenseless. Um, and there, there was a historical connection between like shall and should in older English, but, but nowadays it, it, the modals are just without tense. And I think that definitely makes sense for a lot of these examples, like uh, shall and should. Uh, you, you know, when you, when you use should, there's no tense there nowadays, certainly. Uh, the can and could was the one I was most resistant to when I was reading this last time, because I, 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 I feel like could is still the past tense of can. Uh, and they argue against that, uh, if memory serves a little bit later in the chapter, and say that, okay, it, it looks like it may be the past tense, but it's really not anymore. But I, I, I feel like for can and could especially, it, it's the past tense, present tense relationship still holds. But like I said, uh, this is on the, my rereading of this chapter. I just got barely into it this week. And that's all from the grammar book. Uh, the rest of my reading this week has been from the Brothers Grimm uh, in my effort to read the whole thing from cover to cover. And I got up to page, uh, I got from page 42, which was story number six. Uh, page 42, story number six, Faithful John. Up through, I finished story number 62, uh, The Queen Bee. So that's page 336 um, for a total of 294 pages read this week. So I know on BookTube, that's not saying much. Uh, there's a lot of ferocious readers on, on BookTube, but on my channel... If you're familiar with my re reading pace, that's a good reading week for me. Uh, I, you know, I, 20 pages a day, if I'm lucky, is, is about my reading pace usually. So, uh, you know, about 140 pages a week is about my average. So to get 294 pages done is good for me. Uh, and of course, it's the Brothers Grimm. It's children's stories, so it's not exactly... James Joyce here or anything like that. It's not heavy going, but it can definitely it can definitely get tiresome. Actually, actually, I I complained about these stories uh, last week, and then I was getting into it this week, and I was quite enjoying a lot of these. Um, so I don't want to, yeah. I don't, I don't want to complain too much about it because there's a lot of pleasure to be had. On the other hand, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend anyone else read through this cover to cover as if it were a novel, like I'm attempting to do. I'm going to finish it now that I've started it, but I don't know if I'd recommend anyone else to do that because it, it gets quite tiresome just reading, reading it all straight through. So, um, yeah. Uh, wh why don't I start with the tiresome bits? Um, actually, no, let, let me just jump in here and make some observations. Uh, part of the problem is the problem with any short story collection. Uh, in that, uh, short stories are meant to be read, savored, uh, and then maybe come back to later. It's I don't think a sh I don't think a short story collection like this is meant to be read straight through. As in, okay, this is my this is my book for the week. I'm gonna sit down and you know read this for 20 minutes. See see how many pages I can get done. I think what you're supposed to do is just pick it up, read a story. Like okay, this is tonight's story. Uh, I'm gonna read Tom Thumb. Finish the story. Enjoy it. 
uh, and then come back to it maybe on another day. Um, although, if that's the way you would approach this book, and that's probably the way you should approach this book, you, you'd never really get to the end of it. Uh, I mean, there are 210 stories if you count the legends. Um, so perhaps, I don't know. You, you could live a perfectly full life and never read the Brothers Grimm cover to cover. Uh, I've got it in my head that I want to cross this off my reading list. This is one of the classics. Um, so I, it's, it's one of the books I'd like to tackle this year. Um, and if that's your mindset, then maybe the, the thing to do is to read it all cover to cover. Uh, and then put it up on your shelves and come back to it later periodically. And, uh, you know, maybe get like a really nice edition uh, that you can... I mean, so, something like this uh, is, is more of a paperback that doesn't look so nice on the shelf. But, but a very nice edition that can sit very prettily on the shelves. You can just choose a story at random every now and again. Um, because, yeah, the problem with reading this cover to cover is you, you get done with a story and then you've got to just go into another story right after that. And it, it's always the, the, the problem with short story collections is I always find it difficult to or tiresome. To, to have to go through one story after another, I feel like once I'm immersed into one setting, then it's difficult to keep getting acquainted with, with new characters each time. Sorry, difficult isn't the right word. Maybe more tiresome. Um, but then the other thing is that these stories are very repetitive. Uh, they're repetitive in the general sense meaning that the same tropes are used over and over and over again. The wicked stepmother comes up over and over and over again. The, uh, I'm going to go away for a week. Uh, whatever you do, don't go into this room of the house. You can go into every room except this room. That trope comes up over and over and over again. Uh, the, you know, the saving the princess comes up over and over and over again. The, uh, the king saying, okay, here's an impossible task for you to do. Uh, and, and then somebody f trying to figure out how they can do this impossible task that the king has left them to do. It, 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 yeah. All the, the same plot elements are coming up over and over again, which, which is another way that these stories are tiresome. But even more than those general tropes, very specific plot points are coming up over and over again. Uh, for example, the, the girl whose uh, brothers all get turned into birds, and she's gonna find a, a way to break the spell. Or uh, a woman who wishes for a child who's as red as blood and white as snow. Or uh, a boy and a girl who are running away uh, and being chased and they change themselves into a pond and a duck. Th these, these incredibly specific things are popping up in multiple stories. And obviously if the Brothers Grimm had created all of these stories, you would say, okay, well that's just really lazy writing. Um, but of, of course the Brothers Grimm didn't create all these stories. They were collectors of stories. They were, they were folklorists. Now, now, as I mentioned last video, if you do some research into this, uh, it looks like the myth that the Brothers Grimm created around themselves uh, is not quite the reality. Um, they, they had this myth around themselves that they were going far and wide and, and collecting all these authentic tales. Uh, in reality, uh, apparently they relied very much on the people around them and their circle of friends rather than kind of going into the prisons and I, I don't know maybe, maybe they went into the into the prisons and the villages as well but but certainly a lot of these stories uh, come from you know the library or their group of friends uh, and they, they didn't actually go 
as far and as wide uh, for the majority of the stories, for a good part of the stories, at least as they're, uh, they would have you believe. Uh, the other thing is uh, they refined these stories over time through different editions. So this, the stories um, apparently are not as purely from the village mouth uh, as they would have you believe. But uh, that's, I, at, at any rate, that's the general method behind the, this book is they're going out and collecting stories that they hear and not making them up themselves. Which accounts for the fact that there's so many of the same plot elements and so much repetition between them. Um, because, you know, you can easily imagine that out in the villages or wherever, these stories are getting told and retold and somebody is picking up plot elements from one story and picking up plot elements from another story and recombining them into a third story or one story has two different versions. Um, and that seems to be very obviously what's, what, what has happened here where there are all these common tropes that were out there that got recombined into different stories in different ways. So you're like, oh, okay, well, he, you know, here's the one about the wicked stepmother again. Here's the one about the, the girl and the boy changing themselves into a lake again. Uh, here's the one about the, the girl's brothers getting changed into ravens again. Um, yeah, and, and then quite, quite obviously in this book, uh, I mean, they, they, they don't try to hide it, I guess to their credit. Uh, quite often, if they have two stories that are very similar, they'll put them right next to each other uh, in, in the order of the book. Uh, so you'll read one story, and then you, the story immediately following it will have many of the same elements just told in a slightly different way. So, obviously, if, I mean, if you're considering this book a work of scholarship, then I guess that's valuable to have those different versions of the story side by side so you can track the, the different changes that happen to them over time or whatever. Uh, if you're considering this book as entertainment, though, that's a, a bit tiresome. And again, this is something I mentioned last week, but something I came across in my research uh, about this book was when it first came out, people were not quite sure what to do with it. Uh, they weren't sure if it was supposed to be a work of scholarship or something they were actually supposed to sit and read through. Uh, and then only later when uh, selected stories from the Brothers Grimm, you know, Cinderella and Rapunzel and Snow White, and the, the famous stories got published in a selected volume, then that became really popular. Um, but the, the complete Brothers Grimm apparently was not uh, a bestseller in its day. I, I, I should make a caveat with everything I say here, that this is just stuff I've picked up from bits and pieces on the internet. I'm definitely not a scholar here, so if I'm getting anything wrong, somebody let me know. Um, another thing which is noticeable about these stories is the element of the supernatural, which is very random. Uh, so... You know, a character will suddenly get turned into a bird, or a character will die and then come back to life, or a character will... the, the you, you, And obviously these are fairy tales, so there's a lot of magic going on there. But, but the magic is not really explained. Uh, a, a good example of this, maybe, is comparing the Disney version of Sleeping Beauty with the uh, original version in here. Uh, you know, in the Disney version, it's set up that if the prince kisses her, this will break the spell and she will come back to life. This is like one of the caveats that, that's woven into the spell from the beginning. Uh, in this version here, hopefully I'm remembering this right, they're all jumbling a bit together in my brain. Um, but yeah, I believe that the, 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 there's no setup for the prince kissing her, breaking the spell. It's just that the prince happens to kiss her, 
and then she magically comes back to life again. Um, which, yeah, is, is all throughout this book. Uh, the, the, the assumption seems to be throughout most of these tales that there's some sort of cosmic karma or that God is watching everything. Uh, and um, just waiting for the right moment to reward people or punish people. Um, because the, the magic just seems to happen for no reason. Um, so that, that's all right in small doses. But it, again, when you're reading through a um, couple hundred pages of these stories uh, at once or in, in one week, uh, it can get a little bit tiresome. The other thing that can maybe get a little bit tiresome uh, is what appears to be a very sloppy style of narration. And I, I'm not sure if this is a translator's issue or what. I, I don't know how this would read in the original German, but it, it seems to be prevalent enough that I'm assuming it's a, a part of the original stories. Uh, characters would just disappear without any explanation. Characters will reappear in other parts without explanation. Uh, a character will have a name which is not used until like all, all halfway through the story or all the way at the end of the story. Uh, be like, oh yes, and uh, then Briar Rose, because that was the name of this character who we've been following the whole story opened her eyes and you're like, well, why, did, why didn't you tell me her name at the first part of the story? Why, you know, why, why does the narrator suddenly remember her name at the end of the story? The Briar Rose one just being a, an example. Um, I think actually Briar Rose, that, that name came up relatively early in the story. Um, qu quite often there'll be like a wicked mother uh, and you're like, why is this mother so wicked towards her own children? And then, uh, then like at the very end of the story, it'll say, and then the stepmother. And you're like, ah, of course, it was the stepmother the whole time. Uh, that, like in the Hansel and Gretel, Gretel story, it kept talking about the mother and the father, the mother and the father. Uh, and then when Hansel and Gretel get back, then it said, oh, and the, the stepmother had died. And you're like, ah, it was the stepmother. Well, well, why didn't you tell me that at the beginning of the story? Um, or uh, th there's another story where they're escaping, this witch is trying to get them, and then they, they're they running away, and they're in this, they come into this uh, inn, which is full of thieves, and they, they, they're playing some trick on the thieves, and it says, the thieves and the witch, and you're like, well, how did the witch join up with the thieves? I thought the witch was back there. Just, just all this very sloppy narration where... I'm not sure if this is because, again, because the Brothers Grimm were trying to preserve the authenticity of these stories. I, I mean, you can almost imagine, as, as you're reading these, you, you, Jacob Grimm or Wilhelm Grimm sitting out in a village or sitting in a prison, uh, writing down the stories as somebody's dictating it, them to them, and the person saying, oh yeah, and then the witch, oh, I forgot to mention it, but the but the witch from earlier is now um, part of the gang. Oh, and I forgot to mention it, but the, her name is uh, Susan. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention it, but the uh, other character's sister died uh, several years ago. And oh, I forgot to mention it, but oh, it wasn't her sister, it was her stepsister. I, I should have said that at the beginning. And they're just writing down the stories exactly as the person is telling them. And then they're like, okay, well... Um, this is the authentic story. I, I guess we have to write it up like that with all the narration in the wrong order and none of the details fleshed out uh, and all the key information just hidden there at the end. Uh, I guess they didn't have typewriters back then, huh? So just, just print it up exactly as we were told it. Uh, so, so that, you know, like they, they're, they've got all these half-remembered fairy tales from people who are telling them to them and, and they, the, the stories get just written up in, in whatever way their their harebrained informant was giving it to them, I I mean I, I don't know that's that's I mean for such a classic collection of fairy tales, 
Um, definitely seems like they could have smoothed out the narration on some of these. You're like, okay, how, how do these guys get so famous for the, their fairy tale collection? Um, the stories differ widely in tone. Um, but there's an overwhelming sense of macabre. Is, is that how you pronounce the word? Macabre? Uh, lots of people die in gruesome ways. Uh, and I, I realize that pointing this fact out uh, is almost cliche uh, at this point. Um, I mean, th th this is such a classic freshman year at college conversation, right? So somebody like, dude, have you ever read The Real Brothers Grimm? They're, they're, they're so much darker than the, the stories our parents read to us at school, or our teachers read to us at school. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, that is something where the, these stories have definitely been sanitized through the years, first through maybe um, modern editions of them, and uh, then through, of course, the Disneyfications of these stories. The, uh, you know, the gruesomeness, you know, even of a simple story like Cinderella uh, is, and, and again, you probably know this already because this is one of the classic examples where Cinderella's stepsisters cut off parts of their foot to slip it into the glass slipper or when they get their eyes pecked out by birds at the end. Um, I, I think that's one of the examples most people are familiar with about how the, the stories are much more gruesome. Um, but, I mean, not only those, that, those classic stories, but a whole bunch of stories you've never heard of as well uh, are really morbid. Um, although I was thinking as I was reading these, and they, uh, again, this is some of the stuff I just think as I'm reading it, and I haven't researched it, but did, did the Brothers Grimm actually call this their collection of fairy tales, or did they just collect call this their collection of tales? Because I, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if the word fairy tales is something that uh, somebody else transposed onto it, uh, and that they considered themselves more folk folklorists. They were just going out to collect the old folk stories. And some of these folk stories seem to have been kind of spooky stories or campfire stories. Because a, a number of these stories you could quite easily transpose into an episode of Tales from the Crypt or Goosebumps. Uh, the, the most obvious example is, what was it, The, the Robber's Bride? Uh, the, the Bridegroom Robber? What, what was the name of that story? Uh, the, this, this girl is... Yeah, the, the robber bridegroom. So she's, she's promised to mar marry this guy who she doesn't like. Uh, and she, she doesn't trust him. So she, she goes to his house in the middle of these dark woods. And she uh, finds an old woman who says it's dangerous here. They, uh, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost out of time on this video, so I'm going to have to be brief. The um, short version of the story is they're hiding and they see another woman who's brought in as a... a a captive of these robbers who is uh, forcibly made to drink wine and then dismembered and eaten and they, they see all this where they're hiding behind uh, the, the you know hiding from the closet uh, and you, you think okay well this isn't you, you wouldn't make a Disney movie out of this um, but I, I think that's because yeah again it's not supposed to be a fairy tale as we think of them as you know a magical story about a prince and princess I think maybe the Brothers Grimm just considered themselves folklorists who were out to collect the popular tales in the village. And these popular tales were, some of them romantic, but, but some of them were meant to be scary tales, I think. I, I think. that those, those are just my thoughts as I read through the book. Anyways, my time's about up, so I'm going to have to stop it here. Uh, hopefully I'll make some more progress next week and then talk more about the Brothers Grimm and the grammar book.